Hello, everybody. Netroots Nation, I'm Zerlina Maxwell, and I'm so sad we can't be together in person. Uh, if you are a regular attendee of Netroots Nation, you may have heard of me because I am a Netroots Nation faithful. Um, I've been going to all, pretty much every Netroots since Las Vegas in 2011, I think that was. So it's been many years. I'm so grateful to Netroots for having me today. Welcome to your Friday keynote. I'm so excited to be back with my progressive family. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. I am a political analyst for MSNBC. I am the Senior Director of Progressive Programming for Sirius XM. And I'm the co-host of Signal Boost with Jess McIntosh, uh, formerly of Emily's List and the Hillary Campaign. It's the only national feminist morning show in the United States. And I'm also the author of a brand new book, The End of White Politics, which I'm going to take just a few quick minutes to talk about before I introduce a, a stellar lineup of amazing women who really, I think, speak to some of the themes that I talk about in my book in, in terms of making sure we have diverse representation and lived experience experiences reflected in all of our halls of power. I wrote this book, The End of White Politics, which is of course over my left shoulder here, as a clarion call for the progressive movement and Democrats who are positioned to take advantage of America's demographic shifts and to push America towards a much more progressive future. At least that's the goal of this book. I may achieve it, I may not, but I think that it is a statement of aspiration and you should know that I wrote the entire thing before quarantine. So the entire book is pre-COVID, but of course we know about George Floyd. And so when that happened, I revisited the galley and pulled relevant portions that had to do with police brutality and racial justice because many of the themes in the book, despite COVID, um, absolutely are relevant to the conversation we're having now and the conversation we'll have in the future. So first up, what the heck do I mean by the end of white politics? It's a bold title, of course. And that's always the first question I get when I am in an interview about the book, but trust me, the answer is simple. The end of white politics is a statement of aspiration it's one that acknowledges a country where we are able to radically rethink the issues and priorities of our government and center the needs of every single American, regardless of their background, by focusing on identity-based politics. What I want is an expansion of the spectrum of concern. Because in my opinion, identity matters in politics. Since America's founding, We've been doing white identity politics, focused primarily on what white voters need, what white voters want, and other groups of voters are often marginalized, and so are their most pressing needs and concerns. So what are, what are white politics? And really what I'm talking about here more accurately is what are white identity politics? Well, friends, it's very simple. Politics. Essentially, what we've been doing is white identity politics. We just left off the words white and identity, and we focused on white working class men in Ohio and white working class voters uh, in the Midwest. And we talk about suburban housewives and suburban women. And we never talk about the fact that when we use phrases like this, we're talking about white people. And we need to expand the spectrum through which we talk about politics because there are a lot more <laughs> types of people in the United States than just white Americans. And we've reached a moment in history where it's required evolution on these issues and the way we talk about them. Because we need to get something more inclusive and we need to is putting an end to the central and solitary focus on white voters. And that's a good thing for everyone in America. Because if you truly share our progressive values, you understand that focusing on white voters alone 
is outdated and alienating. So let's do away with that as this progressive movement moves forward. Because a fact, a fact a lot of people are not aware of is the Democratic Party doesn't need a majority of white voters to win the presidential election. The Democrats haven't won the majority of the white vote since 1964. So the winning coalition of the future is also the winning coalition of the present and the past. And according to Pew Research, white voters will be a minority of the American electorate by 2045. In certain states, that is already the case. So beyond this demographic shift and the generational shift that is propelling us towards a more diverse America, we also have to understand that that doesn't just mean a pretty picture. It means the change in perspective that is brought to the fore. And as Congresswoman Ayanna Presley says, the people closest to the pain should be the closest to the power. And I think that if our politics is framed around this idea going forward, and we have more representation in terms of the lived experiences that are brought into the halls of power to set policy agendas for the rest of us, we'll get better outcomes. Because lived experiences matter in policymaking. So as I wrap up here, because I'm not going to take too much of your time, because what you're here to see is amazing Congresswomen who are essentially living out in part my thesis, using their lived experiences to frame their campaigns, to be authentic and to speak to those exact issues that their constituents care most about. So I'm so excited to begin this Friday night keynote by introducing somebody who made history in the 2018 midterms. Representative Deb Holland of the first district of New Mexico made history in 2018 by being one of the first Native American Congress people ever elected to the United States Congress. And I want to introduce Representative Deb Holland right now. Thank you so much, Zerlina. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And hello, Netroots. You know, I feel sad that I can't be there in person also, uh, but I'm so happy to be here. And I thank Netroots for inviting me and for the powerful, powerful work uh, that Netroots is doing. As a Pueblo woman and a 35th generation New Mexican, I grew up in a culture that welcomes everyone and shares what we have a culture in which we support each other in times of need so everyone thrives. I learned to carry on the legacy of environmental stewardship of countless generations who came before me. During the summers, I'd spend time with my grandparents and I'd go out to the field with my grandpa to irrigate and pick worms off of the corn. It was there that I learned how we are all connected to the earth and how everything on this planet is connected. We rely on each other. We rely on the water and the land to grow our food, the air to fill our lungs, and nature to keep all of that intact. Each ancestor had taken seriously their responsibility to pass on our natural treasures and a livable planet to future generations. When I ran for Congress, I made climate change central to my campaign, and I'm serious about taking action. I refuse to take donations from corporate PACs or the fossil fuel industry. I focus my time on climate change because it's the greatest challenge of our time. It's our responsibility to protect our planet. It's the connection to our earth that sustains us. And right now it's the desecration of our planet that keeps our communities from thriving. One thing that I've learned in Congress is that even those of us with the best intentions can have a hard time turning proposals into effective policies that get enacted, especially with an administration who is hell bent on selling public lands to the highest bidder and lining their pockets, and a Senate leader who puts corporate interests and polluters ahead of the people. But we have to answer the question, are we going to continue with the status quo or are we going to build a future where every community can thrive? Big structural change is hard to achieve, but we can never, ever give up. Right now, our country is facing crises that are fatefully intertwined. 
Tens of millions of people are unemployed. The COVID-19 pandemic rages on. Racial and eco economic injustice are rampant. And the climate crisis is accelerating. And we have an incompetent president in the White House. The pandemic has put a spotlight on the legacy of environmental racism and injustice that leaves frontline communities far more susceptible to the disease than others. In New Mexico, Native Americans make up less than 11% of our population, but are more than half of the coronavirus cases. Across the country, Native Americans and Black Americans have a COVID-19 hospitalization rate five times that of white people and Hispanic individuals are hospitalized at a rate that is four times of whites. Why is that? Because for years, powerful elites have treated some communities as sacrifice zones and disposable. Years of exposure to radiation from uranium mining, like at my own Laguna Pueblo, nuclear weapons testing and methane leakage from oil and gas drilling causes a poisonous cloud to hover over the Navajo Nation right here in my state. Meanwhile, pollution in Cancer Alley in St. James Parish in Louisiana disproportionately affects the black community. Immigrants and low-income residents in Miami's Little Haiti are being displaced because of sea level rise. And black and Hispanic families suffer from the highest levels of air pollution in the country in Detroit. These injustices are mirrored across other communities nationwide and make them more susceptible to COVID-19 and it's costing people their lives. The inequitable workloads of women are increasing because women, particularly women of color, overwhelmingly make up the essential workforce, bearing the weight of increased needs of children, the elderly, and the sick. This pandemic has forced us to question what is essential and what we value as a country. The people who grow our food, stock the shelves of our grocery stores and put themselves at risk to care for the health of our families are essential, not corporate CEOs and billionaires. This pandemic forces us to answer the question, are we going to continue with the status quo or are we going to build a future where every community can thrive? For me, this is a moment of truth to follow through on the commitments I have made and turn them into effective progressive policies. Addressing the economic crisis and mass unemployment is going to require major investments and we can do it in a way that targets the legacy of racial and economic injustice and takes on climate change. We have an opportunity to not just recover, but to thrive. This vision is at the core of who we are as progressives. And it's also the vision of Joe Biden, the Democratic candidate for president, and Kamala Harris about to make history as the first African American vice president and the first woman in that office. I know they're committed to climate justice because they're engaging climate champions. I'm using my position on the Biden Climate Engagement Advisory Council to move progressive action on climate change forward with the goal that no one gets left behind and we do right by our communities of color. I also work closely on the Democratic Platform Drafting Committee to strongly advocate for environmental justice so that our communities come back from this and thrive. Progressives know that this country needs a bold economic plan that will build a society that values dignified work, guarantees racial, economic, gender, and environmental justice, and a stable climate. So as the theme of this evening asks, how does the progressive movement make sure that when these policies are enacted, they are done so in the way that we want? We must create good safe jobs where workers have access to unions and that they have strong organizing and bargaining rights. We must make sure that the jobs we create have strong labor standards, including wages and benefits that folks can raise a family on. That's why the fight for 15 was so pivotal, pivotal in creating the change we need to see. And now we have a bill that passed the house to raise the wage. Together, we can do the same thing to revolutionize our infrastructure, expand access to clean water, transportation, energy, and high-speed internet and retrofit millions of homes, schools, and offices to cut pollution and costs. 
we can show everyone that we value public health, education, worker protections, livable wages and benefits for the historically underpaid, underpaid and undervalued work. We can protect and restore wetlands, forests and public lands, clean up pollution in our communities, create opportunities for family farmers and rural communities and promote domestic manufacturing of clean tech. We must insist that recovery invests in black, brown and indigenous communities to counteract racial and gender injustice, empowers those communities to implement their projects and prioritizes local and equitable hiring and contracting. We must ensure healthy lives for all of us by cleaning up health hazards, replacing lead pipes and ensuring equitable access to health care, especially in communities that have endured disproportionately high COVID-19 death rates. I'll tell you, the people who work in the fossil fuel industry on the rigs and the oil fields, they aren't the enemy. The corporations and special interests that take hold of our political structures and force dirty energy down the throats of those workers and poison our communities for the sake of profit are the enemy. We can bring those workers and communities who will be affected by our renewable energy revolution with us. We can ensure every family can thrive and help diversify local economies and find equitable job training and placement. We have to answer the question, are we going to continue with the status quo or are we going to build a future where every community can thrive? As you know, no matter who controls the White House and Congress next year, powerful voices will try to influence the recovery plan. That's why it's so important for progressives to work from the grassroots up. Folks in Congress need to keep hearing about how the pandemic, unemployment, and climate change are impacting your lives and the lives of everyone in your communities. So alongside progressive groups from the grassroots up, I'm choosing to buck the status quo and work on a thrive agenda to accomplish the vision I just described in the context of an urgency, urgently needed economic recovery. We need to let everyone know that we choose a proposal to change the direction and to be fierce. I'll keep pushing, but you need to keep giving politicians and other leaders the mandate that you want climate action now. This is a pivotal point in history when we can make bold changes and choose to protect our earth, but we need to do it together. We need the voices of the people to back us up because it's going to be a, a fight. Let's be fierce and choose to thrive. Thank you so much, Zerlina. I am so happy to be with you. I'm so happy to be here with you as well. I feel like this is a panel, um, this Friday night lineup is so baller, right? I mean, I feel like if this panel represents anything, it's women, who are outspoken, who are strong, who have come from all different backgrounds and who are progressive, who are going to lead us to that next, that next phase um, in this American experiment. And so I am so excited um, to be here. Thank you so much, Representative Holland. I am now going to be speaking with a panel uh, with your fellow Congress people, um, Katie Porter and Barbara Lee, Congresswomen from California, and also Representative Pramila Jayapal from the great state of Washington. So good evening to all of you. I don't know, did you guys coordinate to all wear red? I literally just texted that to Katie and Barbara and said, we're all wearing red slash orange. So yeah, yes. I was like, I didn't get the memo, but, and I feel a little left out, but it's okay. Cause so we'll just, next time I'll just text. I'll do the group text. You know, we'll all just coordinate on outfits. Um, I, I want to start with you, um, Congresswoman Jayapal, because you very recently, we're all he coming here, and I think a lot of people watching are likely thinking about the attacks on the Postal Service. And they are very concerned with whether or not the president is trying to manipulate or interfere in the election in real time. You confronted Bill Barr on this question about 
any um, manipulation of the mail-in balloting process. Um, what's your reaction to these latest reports about literal mail sorting machines being taken out of large cities and in places where we know they are going to be needed in November? It is literal election theft. That's what's happening, vote theft. And um, actually I questioned Bill Barr on some other things, but at the very end, I did manage to get in that there was a study done by MIT that out of 250 million mail-in ballots that have been sent over the last 20 years, the fraud rate is 0.00006%. And he was literally on that panel um, before the Judiciary Committee trying to make the case that somehow this is fraud. Well, we know that the president and uh, President Trump and Melania have both voted, uh, applied for absentee ballots. It's fine for them. They're pushing absentee ballots in certain Republican states. And now, of course, they're trying to take away the ability for the Postal Service, and he's admitted it clearly, take away the ability for the Postal Service to actually count those ballots and deliver them for elections. So we have to have multiple grassroots strategies here. People need to vote early. They need to get their ballots into a ballot box, if possible. Um, and there are some efforts happening across the country. I was just talking about it last night with some folks who are actually trying to help make sure that they are dealing with this on a local level in right. multiple places. It feels to me like the attacks are very much out in the open in a way that I've never seen before. I've never lived through an election where one side, I mean, it happens to be the incumbent president in this case, um, who is trying to put his thumb on the scale. And he's telling us what he's doing, to your point. Um, so Representative Porter, what can we do? I mean, obviously, um, I think it is smart to figure out the way in which we can cast our ballots, right? And participate and make sure it's counted by putting it in the ballot box. But it feels like this is a bigger problem than just the ability to be able to vote and, and make sure our vote is counted. This feels like an attack on our democracy or, or some sort of undermining of our, our literal system. It feels bigger than just, you know, fiddling around with some mailboxes. Well, it is an attack on our democracy. And it's not the first one that we've seen from this president. And sadly, it won't be the last one before we are done with him. So I think if you feel like our democracy is under attack, I would tell you, yes, honor that feeling. And then ask yourself, what are you going to do about it? Um, Kamala Harris you know, talked recently about her mom always saying that to her as a kid. Do you see injustice? What are you going to do about it? And I think that starts first and foremost with, as Pramila said, making sure you understand at the local level, how is your county going to carry out voting? Because we're seeing even within states, wide varieties of approaches at the county level. And so here in Orange County, it's a tough district. It's a Republican stronghold. I am the first Democrat to represent this patch of land in 75 years. And yet our registrar of voters just put out an amazing report detailing all of the preparations he's made to keep people safe, to protect the right to vote during the pandemic. So it's not just Republican Democrat, although from the top, obviously we have a president who's trying to suppress vote. This is also about the machinery. It's if we're gonna be saved in this time of crisis, it's not gonna come from President Trump. It's gonna come from postal workers who, mm -hmm. who go the extra mile to get things delivered. It's gonna come from the, the long-term and short-term employees at our voter registration offices. So if you're able, if you don't have a health condition, sign up to be a poll worker, sign up to work at your local registrar of voters offices, um, be part of the solution here and find out and connect with local organizations because we're not going to be able to deliver a national solution in the wake of this president. So we're gonna do what we've long had to do when it comes to voter suppression, which is organized person by person, community by community, even as warriors like Barbara and Pramila and I are trying at the federal level to hold this president to account. To that point about voter suppression, Representative Lee, I think you know many of the communities that are being targeted um, with voter ID laws and other arduous um, obstacles and hurdles um, to, to have access to the ballot box. Many of those communities are the Democratic base. They're black and brown voters 
um, their younger voters, you know, um, college campuses, uh, college students, high school students. And so I think that these laws are definitely targeted in a partisan way, but to the representative representative's point, I, I don't think um, what's happening right now necessarily is partisan, right? I think everybody should want more people to vote than fewer. Um, so my question to you, Representative Lee, is essentially about your thoughts on whether or not this is racist voter suppression. Because many of the, I mean, like I said, the communities that are being targeted, they're not white. They're not suburban. You know, they're going straight to the urban communities, taking those drop boxes out of there so that people cannot participate. Um, so do you think this is racist voter suppression? It is, absolutely is racist voter suppression. And let me tell you, uh, it's also another form of a poll tax. It also is another form of trying to make sure that uh, people are, especially people of color, are so uh, frustrated until they just won't go vote. Now, let me tell you, I was uh, campaigning for, I still say our governor of Georgia, Stacey Abrams. Mm -hmm. And I was there several times. And on the first day of early voting, I saw lines and lines and lines, primarily of African-Americans in rural communities. And they would get up to the front of the line after taking off work and spending a whole day finding that their name was not on the roll. Then had to uh, figure out where their polling place was. And so they're very, there are a lot of subtleties that uh, tell me that this is racist uh, su voter suppression. Uh, also in terms of just voter ID laws, when you look at that, uh, I, my aunt is 99 years old. Uh, if she had to produce uh, a birth certificate, African-American woman, 99 years old, where's she gonna get a birth certificate from? Uh, and so she would be unable to vote. And, and so when, and when you look at where these um, laws are targeted and where voter suppression is, it's primarily black and brown communities. And so, yes, we have to call it what it is. We have to speak through the truth. And our communities though have to know that we have to fight back because in addition to voter suppression, we know that there's foreign interference. Right. And we know that the foreign interference uh, actors that are out there, they're targeting also black and brown communities to try to uh, divide and conquer, to try to create confusion, to try to turn us toward, uh, against each other. So this is another manifestation of racist voter suppression. It feels like, um, just to follow up on that point about the foreign interference piece of this, in 2016, we saw Russia, you know, pose as uh, Black Lives Matter uh, activists and, and Black voters. And, you know, there were a lot of bots and fake accounts that were, you know, pretending to be other people and trying to manipulate the beliefs of voters um, as they were assessing the candidates. Have you in your um, you know, work seen any reports of that happening again? And you know, what's your advice to you know, voters and your constituents on you know, how do you differentiate between propaganda and real and true accurate information? Well, I saw it last time, absolutely. Uh, and of course uh, we know what happened, but I think in, in this instance, we have to make sure that uh, we verify what's out there uh, by calling uh, our office, the county registrar's office. And we have to not believe, when you, when you see something uh, that's uh, on, on the internet that is uh, divisive, just know it probably is a bot or it probably is uh, Russian interference. And, and just don't believe it. We, of course, have been working with the tech companies mm -hmm. to try to get them to come forward and deal with this. And so it, it's very hard because sometimes we're just so busy, we can't figure this stuff out. Uh, but I think at this point in time, given that our democracy is so fragile, we need to, anytime we believe even that something is going south, we need to check in and verify with those that you trust. Uh, and hopefully that's your elected officials and your, your uh, you know, NAACP, right. your uh, uh, voter, uh, participation civic engagement organization. Absolutely. Lena, if I can just follow yes, up please. on that. We, we know absolutely that the Russians are launching a full out effort to interfere in our elections and to promote Donald Trump. That even the director of intelligence um, under Trump has released a statement saying that. So I think we should all be very clear 
about what's happening. And Barbara is exactly right. We got to check our information. We're going to continue to put pressure on the tech CEOs. I actually asked Mark Zuckerberg just about this question uh, the day after Bill Barr. Um, I said, are you too big to care that you don't even want to do anything about the ad boycott that several uh, incredible civil rights organizations are running to say to Facebook, you need to take on this hate speech and the, these mistruths on your platform. And he said, of course, we're not too big to care. But I think if you don't respond and you deliberately mock and say mm -hmm. that advertisers are, of course, going to come back, that, of course, points to monopoly power um, mm -hmm. and anti-competitive behavior. And it also points to the fact that those platforms have a lot of responsibility here and they really do need to step up. At the same time, you know, it does come down to how we respond to that. We already know that there were posers that were put in to the Black Lives Matter protests in Minneapolis mm -hmm. and that some of those people were, um, were paid to come in by conservative groups. So we, we just have to really recognize what's happening here and do exactly as Barbara said. We all do exactly as Barbara said anyway, <laughs> full time, but do exactly as Barbara said and check and verify and never believe um, what you're seeing. Check and verify. So I essentially have the same question for all of you because we're sitting here in a pretty amazing week. We're, at, we're sitting here on a Friday night um, after a week where history was made. Um, you know, I woke up the other day and I looked around and I was like, what is this unfamiliar emotion I'm feeling? Oh, hope, <laughs> hope. That's what that is. Um, so I, I want to just go around the circle here. I'll go left to right in terms of the order that I have on my screen. So Representative uh, Porter, first to you. First part of the question is, what is Kamala Harris and, and her being on the ticket? What does that mean to you? And how can progressives work with a future Biden-Harris administration to push forward on our shared progressive values? Well, it's obviously a historic nomination. It's one that gives me hope, too. Um, it's also an opportunity for a partnership. Um, this is somebody who has changed her views as she's changed jobs, as she's changed roles, as she's learned, as she's grown. And that's our opportunity as progressives to ensure that that continues. I worked with Senator Harris when she was our attorney general on the bank settlement. And I saw her walk out of a negotiation, angering not just the big banks, but even angering Democratic attorney generals who felt that she ought to get along to go along and she wasn't willing to do it. She wanted a better deal for the people of California and she asked me to help fight to make that deal happen. So we all have a role, every single one of us in shaping the Biden-Harris administration. And that role is more than just disagreeing, it's trying to positively influence that agenda by being loud, by being strong, by being strategic, by doing the kind of work that folks like Pramila are doing on policy committees, but also by speaking up and asking, why don't you have a policy committee on the issues that I care about, for example? So we've been talking with the Biden-Harris campaign. We wanna see, a, I wanna see a committee on consumer protection. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important. I wanna see a committee on antitrust and market power. And then I wanna see that committee staffed with the very best minds who are willing to stand up and speak truth to power and help push the Biden-Harris campaign to be ready to do that on day one. Uh, Representative Jayapal. That, that was so beautifully said. Um, you know, I also feel a lot of joy. Obviously, Kamala Harris and I were elected the same night to Congress. I became the first Indian American woman in the U.S. House. She became the first Black and Indian American woman in the U.S. Senate. Uh, the, the second black woman, the first Indian American woman in the U.S. Senate. And, and our families have a connection, strangely enough, um, that I wrote about in the LA Times today. There, there's an op-ed there. But I think that what um, Katie is saying is so important. I worked on the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force. I co-chaired the healthcare task force. And we saw how Joe Biden was able to really develop his platform and, and have a much more bold healthcare platform. Did it get all the way to Medicare for All, which is what all three of us believe should be the case, all four of us, I don't know, I don't, I don't wanna speak for you, Zerlina, but 
um, you know, that that's what it should be in, in the United States. No, we didn't get to Medicare for all, but we got significant foundational pieces of Medicare for all into this platform, including that a public option, any public option would not be administered by private insurance companies, but would be administered by Medicare, a substantially better uh, public option at the platinum level automatic enrollment. If you get kicked out of your job, we untether jobs and healthcare for the first time. Long-term care supports and services, tremendous expansion of that work. And so I think that we just have to recognize there are two choices on the ballot. It is Joe Biden and it is Donald Trump. And there is nobody that can argue to me that any progress that progressives care about is possible with Donald Trump in the White House, just not possible. So. What does that mean? Can you sit out the election because you don't really like either one? Well, you could, but you know what that is? That is giving a vote to Donald Trump because you're not affirmatively putting it on the table for the other choice. And we know that a third party candidate is not going to win. So that will take away from the votes that we are going to need. And I just think that for progressives across the country, we have to recognize we are, what it means to be progressive is that you are the first to the best and most just idea. And everyone else has to catch up with us. So let's celebrate that we're out front in front of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris on a bunch of issues. Let's celebrate that we can push them in different directions. Um, and let's celebrate that we have uh, removed from office in November, the most racist, xenophobic, constitutionally destroying president that we have seen in modern history. Representative Lee. Yeah, first, let me just say to Congresswoman Jayapal, what a phenomenal job she did on that health care task force, co-chairing it. Because I, for one, carried the first single payer bill when I was in the California legislature. And of course, support Medicare for all. And for progressives to make this type of progress uh, as it relates to the task force recommendations, I served on the drafting committee for the platform this year, 2016 and 12. And this is by far is the most progressive platform. And because of Pramila and those who served on the task forces, the consensus that were, was brought between the delegates uh, from the Bernie Sanders and, and Biden uh, constituencies made this platform so, so progressive, so much more progressive, and it should be used. I hope people read it, because <laughs> mm -hmm. oftentimes it gets put on the shelf, but read it as, as a guidepost and what we need to push further on and what we need to do as we uh, take over, hopefully, if we do our work in November, Democrats. And let me just say, first of all, what uh, the hope that I felt uh, when uh, Kamala was uh, selected as our VP candidate was, was overwhelming. Couple of things. First of all, she was born in Oakland, California, yeah. my yeah. district. I know her very well. I campaigned with her and supported her through all of her elections. And I think I was the first member of Congress actually to support her when she ran for the presidency. So I had a chance to go to South Carolina and North Carolina as surrogates and all over the country. And I saw the enthusiasm that people had for uh, Senator Harris because she's prepared, but because she can relate to people and because she's such a smart, uh, brilliant, but down to earth uh, woman. But also, let me just say, uh, Zerlina, I think what this means, it means another step toward the end of white politics. Yes. I got involved <laughs> in campaigns. I wasn't a registered voter, refused to. I was community worker with the Black Panther Party in the early 70s, and I had class I was going to flunk because we were supposed to work in a campaign and it was McGovern, Muskie, and Humphrey, dating myself, right? Shirley Chisholm was running, and she came as a result of the Black Student Union invitation that I was chairing. And she said she was running for president. And so, you know what? I didn't flunk the cast. I got involved in her campaign. I got an A, went on to Miami as a Shirley Chisholm delegate because I thought that then that was the beginning of the end of white politics. Then of course, with Reverend Jackson, 84, 88, registered millions and millions of people, black people, brown people all around the country, another step toward the end of black of white politics. And so fast forward to today, I just think with, with Kamala, this is another uh, reason to read your book and to understand yes, so, what you're saying you. because it's another chapter in the end uh, of white politics. Absolutely. It, the, the chapter on black women that I have in the book is called In Black Women We Trust. And I feel today that, you know, Joe Biden 
made a choice that some people are saying is a safe choice. And I'm like, in what world is picking a black woman for your presidential ticket in a country where we've never had any women win the vice presidency or the presidency? That's not the safe choice. That's the bold choice. Um, in the last six minutes here, um, I want to go around um, again with the same question. How do you build sustainable progressive power? That is, that's a question I, I want everyone to answer uh, as we end this panel so that folks can sort of have that marinating in their minds uh, this evening. Representative Jayapal, first to you. Well, when I um, came into Congress, I, you know, I never thought I would run for office. I was an outside activist. I've built progressive power on the outside. And um, sometimes that's meant taking on Democrats as well, including Democrats I love. Um, but I think that what I have realized is that we do need to have progressives in power everywhere on the outside, on the inside, whatever, however you want to define that in elected office at every level. And then we have to build the infrastructure that supports progressives to win. And that means that, um, you know, we did a lot of work to build the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center and the Congressional Progressive Caucus Action Fund, a C3 and C4, that can help really coordinate on organizing, on policy, on all of these different pieces and provide information instead of getting it from lobbyists, mm -hmm. um, which is what happens to people once they get into office, but also helping to elect progressives up and down the ticket. We've already seen that I think the path to progressive policy actually runs through the heart of blue districts, as well as swing districts like Katie Porter's, where Katie ran on an incredible progressive platform, and she has now become a standard bearer for those issues in a district where we've always known these issues can win, but we needed people with the courage to pick them up as Katie has done. But also in blue districts, districts where people like Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush and, um, uh, Mondaire Jones and in Washington 10, Beth Doglio, these are opportunities to actually get real progressives into blue districts that can help push and carry our message forward. So I think all of those are really important and everything stems from grassroots organizing, whether it's in the community or whether it's in the political system. Absolutely. Representative Lee. Sure, progressive power uh, is really what uh, is moving this country forward. Someone asked me, uh, a reporter, uh, was uh, uh, Vice President elect, elect <laughs> Vice President uh, Kamala Harris to be Vice President? Wasn't she too progressive? I said, wait a minute. If you think that supporting um, Medicare for all, fifteen dollar uh, minimum wage, going to a living wage, if you uh, think that supporting uh, cl climate uh, change and climate initiatives, if you support clean water and clean air, if you, if, uh, clean air, if you believe that everyone has a right to live in a decent and safe house, if you consider that progressive, then let's, let's get it on and let's build this progressive power. And I think that so, and what Congresswoman Pramila said is so important because I think there's such a way that we can organize in an intersectional way because for instance, as an African-American woman, we have a lot in common with working class white people who have lost their jobs and who have been victim of the opioid crisis. We've had to deal with this forever in our country since for 401 years. And so why don't we work together and try to build that coalition? I come again from a district that coalition politics has been the way that we all get coalition progressive politics is the way that people of color are elected in my district. And so now it, it's so important that we have that inside outside strategy in the Progressive Caucus, the Progressive Center, the Progressive PAC, all work together to build this kind of power. And we can't forget, we have to bring our young people along. We have to mentor our young people because we have to pass this baton to their time now because they have to run this lap of the race. And we have to be there to make sure that they know how to do this. And finally, we have to get money out of politics mm. because we have to build that progressive power around people and not profits. Absolutely, but getting money out of politics feels like the, the, the one structural change that would fix most of the problems that we talk about in terms of improper influence. Uh, finally, Representative Porter, same question to you. How do we build and um, sustain progressive power within our politics? 
I think part of it is not making any assumptions about where progressive politics will be effective. So the real point about being a progressive is that we're trying to solve problems. We're pushing forward an agenda that recognizes where people are and where they deserve and need to be. And that means that you can run and win and connect with people in a deep and sustained way on progressive policy in every single pocket of this country. You might use different words. You might start from a different starting point. You might move ahead on a different issue in one place than another. But we can't say that this district can only be a place for a moderate. This district can only be a place for a progressive. Because the reality is people have problems and they want those who are going to push forward solutions. And that is as true in an R plus one Orange County kind of district like mine, or places like Oklahoma, places like Tennessee, places like Montana, as it is in Democratic strongholds. And so I think it's it's really important that we make space for progressive candidates to run and win on a level playing field in every part of this country. That's so interesting um, to think about, because a lot of times, um, we we see progressive candidates win in districts where it's super blue, um, but it's really important that they should be running everywhere, uh, and they can be run, running everywhere because if you're just talking about issues, to your point, um, you can attract a wide swath of that electorate. I want to thank all of you for joining us for the Friday, the beginning of our Friday keynote here at Netroots Nation. Um, this is a weird Netroots; it's all virtual. Um, but I love the red and I love the conversation that we've been having. Uh, so thank you all so much. Uh, up next, we have a special video from the Biden-Harris campaign. Hello, Netroots Nation. I'm so honored to be able to join you today. And I want to thank you for everything you do to organize online and in communities and for building and growing the movement for justice and democracy in America. You know, uh, what you do matters. And it's how we uh, come together to beat Donald Trump, make real bold progress for our country. You're channeling what Franklin Roosevelt said uh, to, uh, to a graduating class six months before he was elected president of the United States in the Great Depression. He said, quote, yours is not the task of making your way into the world, but the task of remaking the world, which you will find before you. End of quote. He knew overcoming the immediate crisis was just job one. But job two is to build back better than before. That's the task before us in the face of so much immediate crises with the pandemic, the economy, climate change, reckoning over racial justice. But we can do this together. We can do them all together. You know, you are the climate activist that's going to help us build a net zero emissions economy and put us on a course that no future president will be able to undo. You're the caregivers and the working families that feel the squeeze caring for aged loved ones while raising your kids. But, 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 but we can ease that financial burden. We can offer free preschool for three and four years olds. We can make sure that working families don't spend more than 7% of their income on child care, period, for any child under the age of five. We can put millions of caregivers back to work and increase their lot in their standing and increase their skills. You're also a survivor turned healthcare advocate who understands that healthcare is a right, not a privilege. And together we can improve Obamacare and allow every American who wants it to choose a public option, a Medicare-like plan. You're the advocates. You're the advocates who will help us reform the criminal justice system, ensure racial equality in our economy. It's within our power to do this. You know, where we can do things like help states seal the nonviolent criminal records of millions of Americans. So getting caught smoking marijuana doesn't deny you a good paying job in the future, a loan, a career, an ability to rent an apartment. We can do these things, but only if we defeat Donald Trump. And he's going to do everything in his power to suppress the vote. He's already said he's willing to delay or not accept the outcome of the election. In response, we have to remember what Congressman John Lewis said, quote, democracy is not a state, it is an act. We need to act. We need to make sure every eligible voter who wants to vote can vote, whether it's in person on election day or the expanded options like no excuse absentee voting and increase in person early voting. We have to make sure their vote is counted. Every vote is counted. 
will be undertaking an historic effort to beat back this onslaught of voter suppression. We're going to need your help. Only then can we govern after the election as the most progressive administration since FDR. We're in the battle for the soul of this country, as I've said from the beginning. Because of you, we can win it. But I badly need you. The country needs you. So let's get to work. Hi, everyone. I'm Heather McGee. I'm um, really excited to be here tonight on this evening um, to be with all of you at Netroots Nation. I am um, a number of different things, but right now I'm wearing the hat as my role as the board co-chair for Color of Change and a longtime Senator Elizabeth Warren super fan and co-conspirator. I am really excited um, to introduce Elizabeth Warren. Of course, she needs no introduction, really but she's the Senator from Massachusetts. She's a career long advocate for economic fairness for people who've been knocked down and shut out. She's a visionary who gets big things done before she'd even considered running for office, which was not so long ago. Elizabeth Warren created the first new government agency structurally empowered to stop Wall Street from ripping people off. And most recently with her trailblazing presidential campaign, she became the first presidential candidate to eschew big dollar donations and spend all of her big rallies um, in a direct conversation with the people who came to see her, often standing in line, talking to people, hearing their dreams pressed into the palm of her hands with notes and, and whispered hopes for our future um, until the wee hours of the morning. It's that kind of dedication that has made her one of Netroots Nation's most exciting uh, folks to have year after year and uh, one of the most exciting people we have um, to show us what big structural change is going to look like. So I'm so excited to introduce Elizabeth Warren and to have this conversation about what is next and what we all need to do. Welcome, Senator. Oh, thank you, Heather. God, what a fabulous introduction. And, you know, it's just great to be here with one of my most favorite co-conspirators in the entire world. Uh, for all of you uh, uh, who have ever had a chance to work with Heather, you know what a clear and true voice she is for progressive change in this country. So thank you, Heather. Thanks for doing this today. And let me just start by saying, Hello, Netroots. It is great to be back. You know, every year I come to Networks, I, uh, Netroots, I leave feeling inspired, determined, optimistic, and this time it sucks. I mean, let's face it. I miss all of you in person. I miss the selfies. I miss the places that we meet. Does anyone on this remember Las Vegas in August, uh, many years ago. I hope we really got a discount on those rooms. Uh, or Rhode Island. Um, that was in 2012 when you all gave me a huge boost when I ran for the Senate the first time. So this is just a way of saying, I sure wish that we could all connect person to person. I am so proud of the movement that we have built together. And I am proud of the big structural change that we are fighting so hard to create. The problems that we face are huge. America is crying out for leadership. And what has Donald Trump done in response? He has ignored science. He's spanned the flames of racism. And he's employed tactics straight from the playbooks of fascists and dictators. So yeah, this is a time of unprecedented crisis. But I wake up every day with a heart full of hope. And here's why. Vice President Biden is meeting this moment. You know, his long commitment is not to himself or to his own advancement. He has a deep understanding of how to make government work for the people. He believes and competent government that, that helps people. And most of all, he is a basically decent person. 
So this week, Joe Biden selected Senator Kamala Harris to run alongside him. I've known Kamala for a very long time. We worked together during the financial crisis back when she was California's attorney general. And we have continued working together through our time right now in the Senate. She will be a great partner for Joe Biden in making our government a force for good in the fight for social, racial, and economic justice. We need to make sure that Joe and Kamala are elected in November so that they can get big things done for the American people. And I am 100% committed to making that happen. But here's the thing. Nobody does this on their own. A strong grassroots movement needs everyone. So I really hope that you will be in this fight too. And speaking of in this fight, that's what Heather and I are here to talk about today. So Heather, I'm delighted to be here with you. And I think you're the one doing the questions here and you're gonna put me on the hot seat, right? Yes. Good. Absolutely. Um, well, first thing I wanna talk about is, you know, this moment, right? I mean, you ran this historic campaign that was really centered on big plans, big ideas. You took the time to explain the economy and our democracy to people. You, you took the time to teach the American people about corruption and how it's not just some issue that you know, affects um, people who really care about money and politics and good government. It affects our ability to you know, buy a house and save for the future. It affects our clean air and water. It affects everything. It affects, it affects racial justice. Um, and you said, I've got a plan for that. And I think that was something that was resonant with so many people. Um, and people really have looked to you as one of the major leading lights for delivering the kind of big structural change that we need. And, you know, there are a lot of people right now who are worried that because Joe Biden and the campaign, you know, didn't endorse all of your ideas, he doesn't come from sort of a big structural change wing of the Democratic Party, that those plans are going to be shelved. And so I just want to know how you're thinking about that, how progressives should be thinking about this moment. So it's a good question, Heather. And look, let's be honest, these fights are hard. And at times, it can feel like our labor is in vain. But I am here today to remind each and every person that this is a fight to put government on the side of the people. To me, that's what being a progressive is all about. And we don't give in to fear and we don't back down. We persist. As Democrats, we know that government can be a powerful force for good, but only when decisions made in Washington begin with compassion and with a determination to uplift everyone. And that's what Donald Trump is just simply incapable of doing. And that's what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are committed to doing. So for me, you know, it's, it's that simple. Pick any issue that you care about, and it is all on the line in this election. So if it's dismantling systemic racism, think about our choice. Donald Trump stirs up as much racial hatred as he can. Joe Biden has been clear that as president, strengthen America's commitment to justice. Curry is about how student loan debt crushes opportunity. Donald Trump keeps Betsy DeVos in place where she is squeezing our students dry. Joe is in the fight for student loan debt cancellation and tuition-free public college. If you know the importance of appointing judges who are committed to justice, just remember the Republicans stole a Supreme Court seat and Donald Trump has appointed racist, homophobic, xenophobic, anti-voter judges to lifetime positions on the bench. Joe Biden has promised to appoint U.S. Supreme Court justices and federal judges who look like America, who understand the importance of individual civil rights and civil liberties. 
judges who will respect essential precedents like Brown versus the Board of Education and Roe versus Wade, judges who come from different backgrounds, who see the world through the lens of their experience. So to me, the changes are really, I mean, the, the, the choices here are really pretty obvious, but you know, look, but even with all of that said, all of the ways that the progressive wing of the party has moved the center closer to where the country needs us to be. Even so, there are still going to be times that we're going to disagree. I ran on progressive values that I deeply believe in, and I lost. But you know what gives me hope? Joe Biden is a leader who listens. He builds coalitions, he hears multiple perspectives, and his animating concern is to help the most people possible. There is so much opportunity for progressive victories with Joe Biden. And we've already seen in areas like bankruptcy and student loan debt that he, is, he has embraced the progressive vision. This pandemic has also changed the world and it's changed our politics here, here in America. It's made it clear that in times of crisis, state and local officials play an essential role in protecting our communities. So what this says to me is that now more than ever, we need new leaders, we need new voices, we need new people fighting for a government that works for everyone. We need to elect Democrats up and down the ballot to put leaders with progressive values in positions of power. It is simply not enough to win the White House. We also have to hold the House. We have to take back the Senate. We need to win in states all around this country, uh, state houses. We need to put people at the local level who are progressives. We need to put people in positions where they can enact big structural changes. So I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm working hard, but I'm hopeful. You are working hard. I have to say, um, you know, it really does seem like you haven't stopped uh, since the campaign. You know, every day there are four different fights that Elizabeth Warren is picking with somebody who needs a punch in the nose, um, whether it's the Postmaster General, whether it's, um, you know, some obscure Wall Street banker who's not doing the right thing. It just feels like you're always on top of the fights that need to be picked. And I mean, the good ones. Um, and it makes me remember um, just something that happened earlier this summer, um, which was that, you know, at a time when it's Mitch McConnell Senate and we have as Democrats very, very little power, um, you were able to extract an extraordinary win, um, which was um, you were able to win people over and by people, I actually mean, you know, the Republican majority in the Congress to put together a veto-proof majority for your amendment to strip the U.S. military from all honors um, and namings for Confederates, um, to take the U.S. Confederacy out of the U.S. military. Um, it's something Donald Trump was opposed to, and it was something that the Republican Party, the members of the Senate who have not been able to find their backbone on many, many issues, um, were able to, and obviously that's because of the strength of the movement for Black Lives. But I, it, you know, there was so much going on. I feel like a lot of people didn't see that fight. Um, I'd love to just to have you talk a little bit about that. How did that happen, and what lessons does it um, does that victory kind of give us for the future? So I'll tell you exactly what it does. It says when you see your opening, take it. Um, that uh, you know, I'm on Senate Armed Services Committee. And I've been in a lot of fights from that place, uh, principally around nuclear weapons, uh, the fact that the Trump administration is pulling out of uh, the treaties on nuclear weapons, on non-proliferation, on trying to make sure that, that, uh, uh, that we are always in communication with uh, other nuclear powers, uh, and about uh, putting more money 
into our nuclear weapons program. I've, this is a fight I've been in all along. And I just keep banging away at that one every single year. Uh, the fight that we treat um, our military better, that we pay them better, that we do better on housing, that we do better on their education uh, for their children. That's been a big part. Uh, the, uh, the fights that Kirsten Gillibrand, and I always want to do a shout out here, that she was fighting before I ever even got to the Senate about uh, dealing with uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment in the military. Um, so there are a lot of ongoing fights, but it was the right moment on the Confederate generals and naming. And so I put together an amendment and um, there were a lot of folks who said to me, don't push this. A negative vote's going to hurt us more. Just leave it alone. The country's moving in the right direction. And all I could hear in my head every time I heard this was with all deliberate speed. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it, we'll get there eventually. Well, today needs to be eventually. Now needs to be eventually. So I, we're doing what's called the markup, you know, where everybody's in the room uh, who's on Senate Armed Services Committee. And of course, it had been blocked and Hoff was not going to put it into the overall bill. So I brought it up in committee. And um, by golly, there were a lot of people who spoke out in favor of it. Uh, Doug Jones, um, uh, Tim Kaine were just eloquent on it. Uh, Angus King spoke up. And there were Republicans who listened to that. They had some back and forth. But at the end of the day, we got our vote, we got it in, and it's in in the House. And that means, although the bill now goes to conference, uh, we're going to get rid of our nation honoring the people who took up arms against our country for the purpose of preserving slavery. No military bases named after them, no streets, no awards, no prizes, no dormitories. No, the federal government is going to back out of that business. And you know how I think of it, Heather? It's not, this is, this is not going to solve the problems that we've got with racial justice. But to me, it's an important down payment, one that we get even now, with Donald Trump in the White House, with the Republicans in control of the Senate, it is a down payment on the America that we want to build. Thank you so much. Um, you know, speaking of the America that we want to build, I think um, if you look at all the different polling, all the different grassroots organizations, including many that didn't endorse Joe Biden, uh, many that wanted you to be the vice presidential pick, um, it's open and shut. Everyone understands that, um, you know, progressives are out front. That's what we are. And therefore, sometimes it takes a minute for the country to get up, get caught up to us. But that doesn't mean we won't keep fighting and keep organizing and building. So everyone, I would say, is, you know, all in on the election. But then it's the hard part, right? And I've started to think about how if we are lucky, if we do everything right, um, if Donald Trump and his enablers in Congress don't steal this election by gutting the U.S. Postal Service, um, if we don't allow the, the Russians and whomever else to, you know, lie and trick us um, out of, you know, creating the kind of governing majority of Americans who want a more just America, if we do basically the impossible um, and, and win the House, the Senate, and the presidency and get those all firmly in the democratic corner, then we've still got what we knew in the 2009 first administration of the Obama administration, when there was a democratic trifecta and you and I were in the trenches, mm -hmm. um, the financial crisis, trying to win some safeguards against Wall Street greed with the Consumer Financial, Financial Protection Bureau um, and other safeguards. And in that situation, Senator, 
you know, the people we had to win over weren't the Republicans. The Republicans were in the minority. The Republicans um, had, like they have today, made themselves truly irrelevant to the big questions of our time. Um, and so, you know, the conversations that we were having, the fights, the organizing, they were within the Democratic Party. And I think a lot of people who are active today don't remember what that was like. And, you know, if, again, this is not assuming we'll be there, but the best case scenario is that's what we'll have free college, universal health care, um, universal child care, you know, a big Green New Deal, those are all going to be sort of intra-party debates. So what lessons do you have? Because you were actually not in office then, you were on the outside, you're working closely with grassroots advocates. Um, you were really winning the ideas war out there in the media. What lesson do you have from then and then from being in the Senate now how we win? How do we win sort of an inside the family conversation in the best of times? So this is hard. That's what we have to remember when we start this. But you don't get what you don't fight for. And this is what progressive movement has learned. We have gotten stronger. We get out there and fight. And and the way I see it is that at every crucial turning point in our nation's history, the spirit of American imagination has been the driving force of progress and change. You know, the rich and powerful have always tried to rig the system in their favor. There's nothing new in this. Um, today, we mark the 85th anniversary of Social Security, you know, and I can't help but think about the woman who made it happen, Frances Perkins. It, the rich and powerful had been writing the rules to boost their own profits, not to keep people safe, not to help people be more secure, but she got out there and fought back. And so did lots of people across this country. Throughout our history, the forces of division and greed and corruption meet their demise when ordinary people have come together to fight for economic and political power. So I think of it this way, right now, people are suffering, people are sick, people are scared. The coronavirus has laid bare the deep racial and economic inequities that existed in America long before this virus hit our shores. This virus has, has forced tens of millions of people to see more clearly than ever what's broken in our nation and what's broken in our communities. And this matters because when more people see what's broken, then we've got a better chance to change it. And if we choose resiliency and creativity, we can make change. Racial justice, economic justice, environmental justice, they are possible. But understand this, no one's going to give it to us. We have to fight and fight hard to make it happen. So I'm, I'm all in this fight for November 3rd, but understand this, we get the House, we get the Senate, we get the White House, then we just double down on the fight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So Let's zoom forward in time. We are in, uh, let's say, the first 100 days of 2021 in a Biden-Harris administration. Um, you are part of the majority party in the Senate. Um, <laughs> what is, um, What are some of the first things that we need to get done? What I know that you've been extremely influential in the party platform process, extremely influential in the Democrats' response to the coronavirus. And according to some reports, you've been extremely influential in Vice President Biden's thinking. So let's just assume that you still have the ear of your colleagues in the Senate and, of course, of your uh, allies in the White House. What do you think we need to do? So what we have to start with is we've got to get our arms around this coronavirus. This notion that somehow the Republicans put forward that you have to pick between our health and our economy, man, have they got this wrong. Um, until we get this virus under control, we can't rebuild this economy. So it's wherever we are on the virus. And, and by the way, it's not rocket science 
It's the things we already know about at this point. It's masks, it's contact tracing, uh, it's making sure that there are enough supplies for testing, adequate testing and adequate protective equipment for everyone. I mean, those are just the, the obvious pieces, but we've got to get our arms around this, hope that we're moving toward both treatment and vaccine. The other thing we've got to do is we're going to have to do emergency work on the economic front. Um, it's got to be that we get money down into the hands of the people who need it. Um, so that's going to be expanded unemployment. It's going to be help for small businesses. It's going to be housing in terms of protecting people in their housing. Uh, protecting them against evictions, protecting them against foreclosures. It's going to make sure that everyone has got access to the health care that they need. Uh, and it's going to be putting resources in for our children, uh, for child care, uh, for early childhood, for K-12, so that our schools can open, so that our schools can be there, um, so that parents will be able to go back to work. It's going to be relieving the, the pressure on uh, people who have student loan debt. It's gonna be police reforms. They've got to be right there at the top of the agenda. Now I say these things because it's so urgent and I know the temptation is, you could start to blur out, you can say, wait a minute, you know, we've got so many things we need to do, but here's the thing. These are things that touch people's lives every day. And we need to show that we are committed to change, not nibbling around the edges, but big structural change, the kind of change that really will make a difference. And when we start to win, when we show that government can deliver, when we show that we're serious about police reforms, and here are the pieces of what we're doing, when we show that we are willing to put the resources in so that every baby in this country has access to childcare, affordable childcare, so that mamas and daddies will be able to go to work and so that their childcare workers are paid a decent wage that is consistent with the responsibility of the jobs that these people take on. When we start to show, here's a piece we can do, here's a piece we can do, you know what happens? We can do another piece and another piece and another piece and another piece. You know, it crowds into my brain early, early in this process. We have got to first make sure that we are protecting our dreamers, that we are doing through executive order what we can do around immigration to protect people who are here, but also that finally we can demand that our Congress make the real changes statutorily that we need to make. We need to get everybody on a path to citizenship. These are changes we need to make. Here's the good news though. It's a big list, it's a big list. And it's a list about the things the president will be able to do by himself and with help from Kamala and all of his administration. It's a list of the things Congress needs to do. It's also a list of the things the agencies themselves need to do. Have I got a list for the Department of Education? Ooh, and a list for the Treasury Department and a list for the EPA. We got a lot of people who wanna do that work. Yeah. So I think of this, as you ask me, what are we going to start doing uh, on January 21st? And my answer is it's actually all the pieces we start putting in place at the latest, starting on November 4th, mm -hmm. the day after the win, that people are lined up and they are ready to go. Donald Trump has broken so much. Mm -hmm. What? What Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are gonna take is gonna be unlike anything we've seen in modern history. So what we have to do is bring an end to the corruption and make our government in Washington work for the people. But like I said, I feel so optimistic. We have a real opportunity to do this and so many good, smart, energized, passionate, committed people who want to do it. And if we have that grassroots movement behind us, really pushing to make it happen, we're going to get it done. 
Thank you, Senator. Um, I do have to say, you know, as we were talking about the coronavirus, I do just want to say my condolences to you for having lost your big brother um, early on in this crisis. And, you know, you have personally felt what happens when someone in power doesn't care and is completely incompetent. And the crisis that's going on in American families all around the country, the fear and the anguish is, um, you know, reached into your family as well. Um, it, it's enough to, I would assume, make you boil over with rage. It's certainly enough to make me boil over with rage. Um, but you have continued to find a way um, amidst the grief and the disappointments um, to pick yourself up and keep fighting and to keep fighting for the American people. And, and I think in many ways, you know, all of us are wondering how, how can we do that too? Um, because, you know, people can go online and feel like it's an absolute horror show. There's one more uh, stressor. There's one more concern in their family, in their work. Um, people are hungry. People are concerned. People are really feeling like the government may not care at all and that the America that um, we've all been fighting for may actually um, be slipping out of our grasp. Um, but a lot of people look to you, Senator, to wonder, to ask, you know, how do I keep fighting? Um, and so with our last moments, I'm just wondering if you could give some personal advice for people who um, are disappointed and scared and are grieving. So it is hard. You know, I, I lost my brother. Um, and one of the hardest parts was... Once they took him to the hospital, I never got to speak to him again. And we got the reports, you know, third hand from the nurses and went through as families do the, he may not make it through the night, wait, he's gonna do better. And then he's taken a turn for the worse and then we lost it. And I think a lot about the fact that none of us could be there with him. Uh, not his wife, not his kids or grandkids, not my other brothers, not his baby sister. And I, I don't know what it was like for him at the end. And I didn't get to tell him I loved him. That's hard. But what I remember every time I think about this is I'm not the only one this happened to. We're now at over 160,000 families that have gone through the same thing, that have their own horror stories about what's happened. And, and the thing about it is, it didn't have to be like this. It did not have to be this bad. We could have done better and instead the United States of America now has the highest death rate in the world. For me, the way I get through this is to say, I best honor my brother by getting up every day and saying there's going to be some accountability in this country. And in a democracy, the accountability is what happens on election day. So I'm in this fight to make sure that Donald Trump is held accountable for his incompetence and held accountable for his, for his indifference, for his disregard for the lives of tens of thousands of people across this country and hundreds, thousands more around the world. I am determined that he will be accountable and that our next elected leaders will also be held accountable. Mm -hmm. Accountable to the people. This is, this is what we've got. I support Joe Biden in this because he's fundamentally a decent man. And I'll do everything I can 
to help him get elected on November 3rd and to help him build a government that, that works. A government that's not just competent, but a government that's got a moral compass and that the moral compass is not who makes the most money or how do we make the stock market get higher? The moral compass is, are we building real opportunity for all of our kids? Are we, are we moving toward dealing with our, our ugly legacy of racial injustice? Are we moving toward, toward at least plans in place to build some economic fairness into our system? One of the things about running for office, one of the things about being a senator, one of the things about coming back to Netroots every year is the chance to be with people who may be angry, may be exhausted, may be fearful, may be discouraged, but who all have in them that spark of optimism. You know, running for office is an act of optimism. Getting out there and putting your views out there is an act of optimism. Running your blog, uh, uh, interviewing people, writing books, writing articles, writing tweets, it's an act of optimism because you do it based on the notion that your voice matters. And the voices of hundreds of people matter, thousands of people matter, millions of people matter. It's the belief that if we get in this fight and we fight hard enough and we fight long enough and we fight smart enough and we fight with diligence and with passion and we don't back up, that we will make change and we will make it now. I so believe in what we can do together and I'm so looking forward to it. That's what we're gonna do, Heather. You and me and all the co-conspirators on this on this Zoom. That's exactly right. Oh, thank you so much, Senator Warren. Let's not just be allies for one another. Let's be co-conspirators in this fight. Let's stand together. Let's have each other's backs. Um, let's help each other have backbone for the tough fights ahead. Um, thank you all at Netroots Nation uh, for listening, for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Good night. Have a good weekend and stay safe. Thank you.